Hey everybody, Professor Davis here from ChemSurvival.com and the YouTube channel ChemSurvival. Today I'm going to talk to you for a few minutes about cyclohexane again. We've already talked about it once, but now I'm going to do substituted cyclohexane. So remember we built this model the last time out of our Darling Model Kit, and this is a cyclohexane in which I've color-coded my axial and equatorial atoms. And what I want to point out to you today is this. Axial atoms are much closer together in space. See how close those red atoms are? Whereas equatorial atoms are way out here on the perimeter of the ring and have got lots and lots of space all to themselves. And that means that when we put a bulky or substituent on the cyclohexane ring, it's going to prefer, if it can get in there, to be in the equatorial position. So how do we quantify this? Well, we have a total of six axial atoms, which means we have a total of six potential diaxial interactions, meaning we have these two atoms interacting, these two interacting, and these two interacting, and then on the bottom of the ring, same situation. We have these two, these two, and these two. And they're all close enough to one another that they're sort of banging into each other, creating some spheric strain. So when they're all hydrogens, we set these interactions equal to zero. So an HH diaxial relationship is equal to a zero kilojoules per mole of instability in the ring. And that really is, doesn't matter too much to us when it comes to cyclohexane, does it? Because here we have six axial hydrogens, and here we have, oh, you guessed it, six axial hydrogens. So their energies should be identical, and in fact, these rings are identical. So in, in any population of them, I expect to have about 50% looking like this, and about 50% looking like this, and I also expect that not to matter at all, because they are exactly the same molecule. However, when I add this methyl group, everything is going to change. So let's do that and watch what happens. All right, there you go. So I've placed my methyl group in an axial position. So here's methyl cyclohexane. But you notice that in doing so, I've changed two of those six diaxial interactions, right? I still have HH, HH, HH on the bottom, but on the top of the ring, I have one hydrogen hydrogen, and then I have two methyl hydrogen interactions. So I now have four HH and two methyl H diaxial interactions. And these are higher in energy. Now, I can calculate the free energy uh, difference right, that, that results from having this methyl group up here. And uh, that number is actually going to be tabulated in your book. But we all know that this ring can do something about it, right? If we destabilize it by putting this methyl group in an axial position, the ring is just going to flip. And when the ring flips, look at where the methyl group goes. Look at all the space that it has out here to itself. Right? This thing is a very happy methyl group right now. So this confirmation of methyl cyclohexane is more stable. In fact, it's more stable to the tune of having all of its diaxials being hydrogen, hydrogen again. Right? So in this state, we have 4HH and 2-methyl H, and in this state, we have 6HH. So this is going to be the dominant conformer. But I can go even farther than that, and I can use the free energies that I know are associated with those diaxial interactions to calculate an equilibrium constant. Right? Delta G is equal to minus RT natural log of K. And what I discover when I do that is that around room temperature, this particular conformer exists about 95% of the time. So in any given sample of methyl cyclohexane, at any given time, about 95% of it looks like this, and only about 5% of it looks like this. So if I want to predict its reactivity, which model am I going to use? I'm going to use the one that best represents most of the population, which would be this one. So this is why larger molecules or larger substituents uh, prefer to be in the equatorial position. Now if you want to see the calculation actually done, we have a YouTube video for that. I'll put a link to it right there. You can take a look at it. And that'll take you through using the actual energies of these diaxial interactions to determine exactly how much of each conformer you'll have. So go check that out. Um, good luck doing your, your substituted cyclohexane ring flips, and I'll see you guys next time.